so this is a, a joint work with a former PhD student, Luca Benini, who was also a student of uh, Paul Bourgade. And uh, this is about some uh, nonlinear random matrix ensemble. So uh, let me briefly give uh, the plan of uh, this talk. I will first explain uh, uh, where uh, the question we uh, consider come from. And this comes from uh, uh, some new old uh, network questions, and then I will uh, give um, also some uh, previous existing results, and then I will turn to our uh, results, which is uh, more in a random matrix uh, theory, and give some ideas for the proof. Okay, so uh, the main uh, motivation I said uh, for uh, studying non-linear uh, random matrix ensembles comes from neural networks. So uh, in this uh, setting, we consider um, an input column vector x, which is uh, uh, our input uh, data. And then the da data goes uh, through a first, uh, a first layer of uh, a neural network. So uh, this is a combination of both linear and nonlinear functions. So uh, this is here the linear part, which are given by two uh, p times n matrices. And uh, what is important here is that uh, there is an activation function f, which is applied pointwise so to each entry of uh, uh, the vector. And uh, it is here to uh, reinforce uh, some neurons. So uh, I give here the example of uh, what is called the ROLU function, which, uh, which means that uh, there is a threshold which is uh, zero here, under which uh, the um, neuron is not activated. OK, and then uh, so you obtain uh, like this an output vector. And uh, you can uh, consider multi-stage architecture for, uh, for a network. So uh, this is just alternated uh, layers with both uh, linear and nonlinear such functionals. So uh, in artificial neural networks, um, the thing is as follows. You're given, um, um, say, uh, two uh, data sets, x and y. x is the input and y is the output. And you want to learn uh, the synaptic weights, which are uh, the matrices w1 and w2. So there are different ways. Uh, you can uh, try to learn them using, uh, for instance, uh, some gradient uh, descent. Um, I need also to say that uh, the activation function is not uh, unique, and there actually one of the problem is uh, to choose to, uh, to choose the activation function. So one commonly used is the ROLU function, and uh, for some reasons I. Don't, uh, I cannot explain because I don't understand. It uh, accelerates learning, but uh, there is a problem, which is that uh, the process can die in uh, the architecture. And there are some, uh, some other examples, which are the sigmoid function or some other function. So if one wants to uh, understand uh, how such uh, neural networks work, uh, one possible way is uh, to make them random. And this has uh, already been done. I, I will state uh, in the next slide some results uh, from uh, Romain Couillet and other 
authors. So uh, the idea is that uh, the weight, the synaptic rates um, are given by um, a large dimensional random matrix with ID entries. Okay, uh, X, which is the input uh, data set, is still deterministic. And again, it's high dimensional. And the output uh, is um, um, the uh, random matrix, which, um, is, uh, the which is given by uh, when we apply the function f pointwise to Wx, okay? And um, so, so um, the idea is uh, as follows. So we are given, um, say, uh, an input uh, matrix, which is uh, a P sample of photographs with N. And uh, so there are photos of cats and we want to identify the breeds of the cat. So the idea is from the output, try to uh, uh, approximate uh, the correct breed uh, on the photo. And uh, so the training set comes with a D times P matrix, which is the, the target output, which is the correct breed for each photograph. Okay, so, um, to do that, uh, uh, because we are in the high dimensional setting, we um, the um, commonly used procedure is to use a rich uh, regression, which is uh, we consider this uh, approximation for uh, the target uh, matrix Y, and the aim is to minimize uh, the error we make when. Uh, estimating, say, Y with this matrix Z. Okay, so you try to minimize a loss function. Uh, if uh, one makes some computation, one can then show that uh, the optimal B here, which has to be determined, ha can, can be expressed uh, like this, okay? And then uh, what is interesting is that uh, the learning performance can then uh, be expressed in terms of uh, the empirical eigenvalue distribution of a sample covariance matrix, which is M star M divided by P. So this is a usual covariance matrix, okay? Okay, so uh, this question has uh, been investigated in a series of uh, paper by uh, Romain Couillet, I said. And um, for uh, the question in the preceding slide, uh, they have shown uh, the following. They have actually identified the limiting empirical eigenvalue distribution of uh, this sample covariance matrix. So. Uh, they consider a sub-Gaussian matrix W. Uh, F is a Lipschitz continuous function, and um, all the dimensions grow to infinity uh, at the same speed, okay, so that the ratio uh, are all bounded. So then uh, they show that uh, the limiting empirical eigenvalue distribution of uh, the sample covariance matrix of interest has the same uh, limit as another um, spectral uh, measure, I will say. So, which is uh, given by its uh, still just transform here. So, uh, this is. Uh, um, 
equation. I will uh, I will just um, uh, explain in a few words. So uh, one important parameter in this equation is uh, the matrix G bar, which is the expected value of our sample covariance matrix. And um, actually, uh, this equation uh, has already uh, been uh, encountered in random matrix theory since uh, this is a deterministic equivalent for uh, the limiting empirical eigenvalue distribution of um, sample covariance matrix with non-identity covariance. Actually, if you consider a matrix T such that uh, T star is equal to G bar, then uh, uh, the limiting uh, spectral measure of M star M is uh, almost uh, the same as T X X bar T bar, T star, sorry, okay? What is uh, interesting in their result is that uh, the dependence in uh, the activation function is actually hidden as, uh, in uh, this matrix G bar and it's non-universal. Actually, they have shown that um, there is uh, quite a strong dependence on the first moment of uh, the entries and they use it to um, to study uh, the performance of neural networks. Okay, and uh, they also study uh, a lot of other questions uh, for this model. Okay. And then uh, there is um, Another model which has been um, proposed by uh, Pennington and Voram, who consider uh, the fully random case. So this time, uh, the input uh, data set is also random and the weights are random and uh, they consider the the simplest case where uh, W and X are Gaussian random matrices. So uh, for E's, uh, they are centered on risk variance one, actually they, uh, they consider a more complicated case where the variance of uh, W and X is uh, something different. So I state uh, the simplest result. And the output data set is also uh, random. So we consider uh, exactly uh, the, same, uh, the same question. We uh, consider the nonlinear matrix f of wx divided by square root of n. And uh, the associated uh, sample covariance matrix. Sorry. Okay, so you, you're given an input that is set, the output, there is a loss function. Yes. Okay, I'm coming to uh, this question. You try uh, to minimize uh, the loss function. Okay, you find your optimal B. And then the expected value of your loss function can be a measure of your performance and it, it is expressed in terms of uh, the empirical eigenvalue distribution of this matrix. Okay, and um, what um, they show uh, is the following. So there exists a limiting distribution, a limiting empirical eigenvalue distribution provi provided uh, the ratio of uh, the dimensions of x, w. Uh, this ratio converges to some constants. 
okay, and uh, they obtain um, a fixed point equation for uh, the Stilgius transform, which is a quartic fixed point equation. So uh, the um, the way they they prove it is uh, is based on uh, some more or less explicit computations because W and X are Gaussian. We um, we can use some um, analytical tools and uh, some uh, actually they compute the moments of uh, the spectral measure and use a saddle point argument. Okay, and um, okay. Uh, this was done for for uh, Gaussian matrices, and uh, actually they describe uh, the limiting spectral measure using some uh, graphs, which uh, we could not really understand. So we tried to uh, understand how uh, they obtain this result using some, uh, some uh, more general models than uh, Gaussian random matrices. So uh, the model we consider with Luca is uh, again um, some random matrices W and X. And uh, we don't assume uh, that uh, the entries are Gaussian, but uh, we need some, uh, some decay uh, assumption here on uh, the tail of uh, the entries. Uh, we also consider a class of uh, real analytic functions. Uh, I don't give here uh, the all uh, the all uh, assumption. Uh, all the derivatives of f grow at most uh, polynomially on uh, compact sets, and uh, the important thing is that f uh, is centered with uh, respect to the Gaussian distribution, uh, the n zero one distribution. Okay. And we make uh, uh, the same assumptions. The ratios of uh, the dimension converge to uh, some uh, constants as uh, n goes to infinity. Then uh, we obtain that uh, the limiting empirical eigenvalue distribution of G converges to the same uh, distribution mu f as uh, that of uh, Pennington and Vora. Okay, so I will try to explain uh, what is uh, this distribution mu f. So uh, actually, uh, the dependence in f is uh, in two parameters, which are theta 1. So this is the average of f squared. And uh, theta 2, which is uh, the expected value of f prime to the square. And uh, the expected value is always uh, with respect to the Gaussian distribution. OK. And uh, so this is um, the variable quartic uh, equation for the Stilgeus transform of mu f. Um, so uh, I will not uh, discuss here uh, this equation. What is important is that uh, the dependence in F is, lies really in these two parameters, theta 1 and theta 2, and, uh, which means that uh, the limiting distribution mu F is uh, universal in this fully random uh, setting in contrast to the case where x was uh, deterministic. OK, uh, some more um, there are uh, the limits of the ratios here. OK. So uh, what is important is uh, if uh, 
theta 2 is uh, zero. This is, uh, mu f is the Marchenko Pasteur distribution. And uh, the other extremal case is when uh, theta 2 is equal to uh, theta 1. And uh, in this case, uh, the, the measure mu f is the same as that of uh, a linear random matrix model, wx divided by square root of n. And uh, in the other uh, cases, uh, this is some kind of, um, of interpolation. I will come back on this uh, later. Okay, so um, this uh, could be of interest for uh, applications to neural networks, and uh, this was. Uh, this was actually already a question in the, um, the article from uh, Pennington and Vora, because this can help to uh, determine the activation function. Uh, uh, the Marsh and Copastour distribution is, uh, is a good limiting distribution, because um, it means uh, that um, there is uh, not much uh, distortion uh, between the output and uh, the target that, that I set. Okay. Uh, a few uh, simulations. So the first one uh, corresponds to um, the case of uh, where there is uh, no special uh, choice for the parameters theta 1 and theta 2. This is a generic case. The second case is uh, the marchenko pasteur distribution. So theta 2 is uh, equal to um, 0. And the last one is when uh, theta 2 is uh, equal to uh, theta 1. So we get a, a linear random matrix uh, ensemble again. And uh, if in addition uh, the um, largest, sorry, f is bounded, uh, then uh, the largest eigenvalue sticks to the support of uh, the distribution mu f. Okay, in all cases, uh, the support of mu f is compact. I didn't explain that. Okay, um, another uh, possible description of uh, this limiting uh, distribution mu f. So, um, because I said uh, this is some kind of uh, interpolation of uh, two linear models, the Marchenko Pasteur one and uh, the product uh, Richard case. So actually, uh, one can show uh, that this is, uh, this is uh, really the case. So uh, I need to introduce another uh, random matrix C, which is uh, just uh, Gaussian. And W and X here will be, uh, again, uh, Gaussian random matrices. This is not important for uh, the limit. Then one can show that uh, mu f is uh, also uh, the limiting empirical eigenvalue distribution of an information plus noise uh, sample covariance matrix. So. Uh, Okay, how can I explain this uh, formula? Uh, the information plus noise uh, matrix is um, Z plus uh, A and Z plus A uh, star. Okay, so you just uh, replace, uh, so Z is uh, Gaussian, say, and we just replace air a with uh, 
a product uh, result matrix and uh, simply the weights on uh, each part of uh, either uh, Z or A uh, depends on theta 2 and theta 1. Okay, so uh, this result is uh, uh, related to uh, the free convolution which has been uh, already studied by Florent Benech. And this is uh, also some kind of uh, similar to uh, the result of uh, M. Carwi who studied the kernel matrices. Okay, and uh, because uh, we are interested in more than one layer, we can consider, um, I just uh, gave the limiting empirical eigenvalue distribution when there is one, uh, one input and one output and one goes through one layer. So uh, we would like to consider more than one layer. Actually, we can only consider a fixed number of uh, layers. So at each step, we introduce uh, some new uh, random matrices for the rates. So the matrices WI, which are independent. And uh, this satisfies the same, uh, the same decay assumption as before. And uh, we form uh, the output matrix at each step, except so we start from uh, the output at layer L minus one, and uh, we again um, consider uh, the output data set, except that we normalize here uh, the matrix so that uh, at each step, uh, the variance of M is one, okay? This is, uh, this is uh, what is called batch normalization. And uh, we are interested this time in the limiting empirical eigenvalue distribution after uh, step L of our, uh, um, our network. So we studied only the case where theta 2 is uh, equal uh, to uh, 0 and f is in addition bounded. And then we can show that uh, at each step the limiting empirical eigenvalue distribution is the marchenko pasteur distribution. Okay, and uh, to, so this uh, finishes uh, the results. All this has been uh, conjectured by Pennington and uh, Vora. And uh, what uh, one of, uh, one of the main problems here is that we cannot uh, push L to grow to uh, infinity, okay? So this, is, this would be uh, the, the uh, interesting results. Okay, so I will now give uh, some ideas uh, for the proof. Um, so this is a simple uh, moment method. And uh, we start uh, with a case where f uh, is a polynomial. And the easiest case is when f is an odd polynomial. So we, we want to uh, compute the moments of uh, the spectral measure of g. And uh, we do, as for uh, Wigner's theorem, we develop the whole trace in terms of W and X. Okay, so uh, there are a lot of uh, indices, I, J, and L. And uh, because we um, assume that uh, the matrices W, X are independent and the entries are independent, uh, we need each entry to arise twice. So we will need to find a way to um, encode such a summons in order to, uh, to see how, uh, how one can compute 
the moments. Okay. So I and J indices will play a, a different role than uh, the L indices. Just um, let me explain, because the J and the I's are necessarily repeated. Okay. So we encode uh, the, um, the summon in the following way. Uh, so we first assume that all i and j indices are pairwise distinct. So uh, this means that uh, we can uh, draw the i and j indices on a cycle of length 2q. And uh, the um, blue vertices on uh, this cycle uh, correspond to an L index. Okay. And um, if there is a label L here in this niche here, I1, J1, this means that I read W, I1, L, X, L, J1 in my uh, expected value. Okay? Okay, now uh, I have this constraint that uh, each of the W and X entry uh, need to rise twice, so I need to match the blue points. And uh, I... Uh, the basic idea, I would say, is that uh, we want to maximize the number of pairwise IJL uh, indices. So if I assume that the I and J indices are pairwise distinct, I will try to maximize the, uh, the number of L indices. And uh, if I want to do so, uh, one can check that uh, the good way to do it is uh, to match L indices inside niches. Okay, but then uh, I told uh, that K, the number of blue points inside the niche is odd, so I cannot. Uh, obtain a perfect matching inside the niche, and I need to add a cycle which uh, necessarily has to go along uh, the whole cycle, actually. Okay? So uh, this is a case where Q is uh, bigger than 1, and uh, if uh, if one wants to uh, determine the number of ways to perform a perfect matching and also to determine the cycle. So in each niche, we have uh, k possible choices for the vertex in the cycle and then a perfect matching for the k minus 1 remaining uh, blue indices. And this gives the parameter theta 2. Okay. Uh, the last case is uh, when uh, Q is uh, equal to 1. So uh, in this case, we get uh, uh, simple cycles of length 2 and 2K uh, blue points, which can be matched, bleh, matched. actually uh, uh, without considering niches, and this gives, this time, the parameter theta 1. Okay, so now, if uh, I remove uh, the assumption that i and j are distinct and I make some uh, identifications, we can uh, obtain in this way cycles of length 2 or longer cycles. And, uh, we can then uh, show that uh, those, uh, those graphs which uh, contribute in the limit are those for which uh, that they are called actually cactus graphs. So which means that uh, one can see them as a tree of cycles, okay? So the black graph is okay, but if I add an identification here, this is not a contributing graph. 
Okay, and uh, so this is my black graph on the I and J indices, a tree of cycles. And then uh, inside each cycle, uh, so that it contributes uh, in the limit, uh, a typical matching is as before, which is uh, if the cycle has length greater than two, we have a full blue cycle and perfect matching it's inside niches, so this gives a theta two. And if the cycle has length two, we will obtain a contribution of theta one. Okay, so um, in the end, uh, we obtain uh, this formula for uh, the moment of uh, the probability distribution mu f. Uh, call AQ, this quantity actually is the number of cactus tree, uh, cactus graphs, sorry, which have been obtained using a certain number of I and, uh, identification and similar for J, and with B cycles of lens two, we obtain this formula for the moment of mu f. Okay. And um, uh, we have done uh, this computation for uh, an odd monomial for the moment, but uh, actually the dependence in F is only in theta one and theta two. If uh, and we recover uh, the expected the expected properties. So uh, if theta two is zero. Uh, we obtain uh, the number of fat trees, and if theta one is equal to uh, theta two, say equal to one for is, uh, we simply get uh, a sum over uh, the cactus graphs. Okay, and then uh, we can do the same for. Um, even polynomials. And uh, due to uh, the fact we assume F is centered with uh, respect to the Gaussian distribution, this means essentially that uh, we ban uh, perfect matchings inside niches. So we need to, uh, to match uh, blue vertices uh, uh, from one niche to uh, another at least once. So for long cycles, this will uh, give a negligible contribution. And uh, only cycles of length two will uh, contribute in the limit, okay? And then we go to uh, arbitrary polynomials. And uh, the extension to uh, our class of activation functions simply follows from a Taylor approximation, okay? Uh, for uh, the largest eigenvalues, this is simply we can uh, push the argument up to Q in the order of log n. So uh, we don't know exactly where uh, the top edge of uh, the support is, but uh, the largest eigenvalue cannot exit uh, the support with, under our assumptions. Okay, and I will finish with... Um, the extension to uh, multiple layers, uh, just in the case of uh, two layers, I, I will just give the ideas. Uh, no, uh, this is far from a proof. So um, after, uh, after the first layer, uh, our output is a matrix M1. So this is different from X because uh, its entries are not independent. Okay, so the idea will be to come back to independent matrices. So again, we assume uh, that the I and J indices are distinct, and we consider the output after layer two. We cannot uh, say anything about matching uh, the entries of M1 because they are not independent, so we simply match uh, the W entries and consider uh, the induced, uh, so uh, if I match these entries, this will mean I will forget about the I indices. 
and uh, I consider the induced graph on uh, J and N indices. Okay, so this will give me some uh, some moment uh, to be computed. Okay, uh, and uh, we can show that. Um, The graphs which uh, contribute in uh, the limit are such that, uh, ah. okay, so the green edge uh, will be important here. So there is a single edge uh, linking two niches adjacent to the same I, uh, I vertex, which is a bridge. Then uh, we can make identifications between bridges. So um, in the end, this may result into a JL graph, which is uh, not connected. And uh, uh, the remaining edges inside the niche are matched according to a perfect matching, which gives here what we call flowers. Okay. So, there are k minus one flowers at each step. And when you multiply layers, you multiply at each step uh, the number of flowers. Okay, uh, as a conclusion, so uh, this, was, um, this was a way actually uh, to understand uh, the result of uh, Pennington and Var because they gave they gave these graphs, and we could not understand where uh, they came from. So uh, this works for uh, the fully random case. If W is deterministic, uh, we get we get nothing uh, nothing interesting. It doesn't work either for f of x, if x is a, a Wigner matrix. Uh, one of the main problem is that it doesn't work for the most commonly used uh, function, which is uh, the ReLU function, but uh, for some others, which are uh, simpler. And uh, what is funny is that uh, if we consider complex, I didn't say matrices are real, but if we consider complex matrices, with uh, uh, the usual assumption that uh, the expected value of W I L squared is zero, then we only obtain a Marchenko Pasteur or product with short limiting distribution. Thank you for your attention.